Okay, we're on part two of the lecture now, Seven Perspectives, and then there was Freud. Da, 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 da. 1856 to 1939, he wrote Interpretation of Dreams in 1910. He was about at his peak then. So remember around 1850 to 1900, we have the rise of scientific thinking, and common people are starting to become more aware of science as a source of knowledge. Um, now it's everywhere, right? <clears throat> but not then, especially in terms of things like the psychological disorders. So Freud was an, from Austria, and he was the founder of what's referred to as the psychodynamic tradition. Now, dynamic means busy. And psyche means the mind. Originally, it refers to the soul. So what this is referring to is busy mind. And it's also referred to psychoanalysis because Freud was really is given credit for being the originator of talk therapy. <clears throat> All right, so Freud and his work was happening at the same time as the behaviorists in Germany. Freud was seeing patients in Vienna. He is a medical doctor, a neurologist. So if you had trouble with your back, you went to Freud. And there would be a certain number of patients that Freud saw that had a disorder that was referred to at the time of as hysteria. And it tended to be a female disorder. And it was, you know, such oppressive and repressive time for women where they didn't have any rights, they didn't have any rights to property or very limited rights to property, um, all kinds of social mores that women needed to live by. And there was this idea that um, hysteria, hysteria or hysterical neurosis could result in symptoms that ranged from faintness and nervousness to insomnia irritability, sexual desire, a tendency to cause trouble. So, you know, a very generic disorder. And hysteria has been long thrown out of the medical textbooks because a woman could be commissioned to an uh, insane asylum by an uh, um, ill-intending husband using this kind of um, diagnosis. So basically just using any kind of pointing the finger at emotionality. So the most mysterious symptoms of hysteria were physical symptoms, things like a chronic cough, difficulty breathing, blurry vision, stuttering, seizures, even limb paralysis. The doctors, neurologists like Freud, could find no cure for. Now, mind you, at this time, there is no formal field of psychology at the major universities. In fact, Freud's the one who actually really popularized the notion of psychology, which really is looking at medical reasons, rational reasons for illnesses, including illnesses of the mind, uh, like hysteria was seen at the time, and this hysterical neur neurosis, violent emotional outbreaks, and disturbances of sensory motor functions. And disturbance of sensory motor functions could include things like not being able to move your hand, feeling paralysis in your hand, or having um, sort of seizure-like behaviors, but doctors not being able to find a physical cause. And Freud was seeing a percent of the patients that he saw, maybe a small percent. You could probably, according to a similar percent of doctors who might encounter anorexia or eating disorders today. So that might be 20%, 10 to 15% if we include bulimia of the younger women. And so Freud would see that many. So enough to, to see a pattern, right, and start to look for answers to it. And Freud, you know, if you saw The Illusionist or The Prestige, those movies, then this is the time period, right, where magicians and um, hypnotists are absolutely amazing frontline stage acts because they're mind-blowing and people are fascinated with them. And there was a, a hypnotist at the time named Jean-Martin Charcot, um, considered one of the founders of modern neurology. He was also a medical doctor and a neurologist like Freud. And 
Charcot hypothesized as a medical doctor that hysteria, particularly the kind of hysteria that included loss of limb or sort of epileptic-like movements, was a genetic neurological disorder rather than spirit possession. So here he is um, seeing it as a medical problem, not a uh, spirit possession problem. And one of the things that Freud, uh, that Charcot did, this is a, a drawing of Charcot with a bunch of medical doctors. And what he's doing here is hypnotizing a woman. And under hypnosis, he suggested that the woman had um, inability to use or operate a particular limb. And under the um, state of hypnosis, that was the case. And so he's able to demonstrate inducing hysteria into a patient while under the state of hypnosis. And this is again in the late 1800s. So <clears throat> that, of course, begs the question of, you know, is hypnosis real? Under what conditions? You know, can a person be hypnotized? Is it, you know, can people control themselves when they're hypnotized? And the answer is to all of those is that um, we range in our ability and our vulnerability or our willingness to be susceptible to hypnotism um, from a scale of, say, low to high. And some people are very open to suggestion and willing to be hypnotized, right? And those people are often able to move into, say, imagination and fantasy easier than other people. And so that, and other people don't want to let go of ego structures and a sense of control, and they will not allow themselves to be hypnotized. So hypnotism is very much still under your control. But when people are willing, Charcot was able to demonstrate that he could induce a hysteria condition. And then when the woman was brought out of hypnosis, the hysteria condition would be gone. Now, Freud saw this and came up with a brilliant, truly brilliant um, theory about the human mind that we all now in modern times presume to be true. We're all modern Freudians. In addition to Charcot, there was another theorist, physician who studied hysteria that Freud worked with. His name was Joseph Brewer. And Freud and Brewer worked together on the case of Anna O, oh, the famous case of Anna O. Oh, that's not her real name, protected uh, to protect confidentiality until she and anybody who was related to her that there were concerns about passed away. Her real name was Bertha Pap Pappenheim. Um, so anyway, Bertha was one of the first patients who had a hysteria condition that Freud worked with. And used his theories to try to help heal. Now, through hypnotism and car talk therapy, Freud and Brewer were able to help relieve Anna O's symptoms, at least temporarily. And the idea of psychoanalysis or the talking cure was born. So let's take a look at this quote that comes directly out of Freud's five lectures on psychoanalysis in 1909. Quote, we found at first to our great surprise that the individual symptoms immediately disappeared without returning if we succeeded in thorough awakening the memories of the causal processes with its accompanying affect, affect means emotion, and the patient circumstantially discussed the process in the most detailed manner and gave verbal expression to the affect. So what Freud is referring to here is that they were able to, through hypnotism, and talking, able to help Berta come to connection to early trauma, and through the expression of that early trauma, experience some relief in her hysteria symptoms, in, in her case, in her uh, unwieldy gait, and uh, difficult, she had difficulty breathing, and um, difficulty with, you know, some limb partial paralysis, and things like that. <clears throat> Through this process, and this is a picture of Freud, and he was always smoking a cigar, and so that's why there was a lot of images with him with a cigar. Freud observed that the hypnotist Charcot could induce a physical symptom while a woman was under hypnosis and then remove it when she woke. Brewer was able to remove Anna O's symptoms through in-depth talking about the ailment. From these two insights, Freud drew a powerful conclusion. 
that hysteria must be caused by the psyche itself, by the mind, uh, by the part, uh, a specific part of the mind, because the women, if they could fix themselves, they would have. So Freud made a massive leap and, and realized that there was a part of the mind that's unconscious that, uh, that was causing the women's behavior. Really a paradigm shift in thinking. I mean, not for us, because we're all Freudian in this sense. I mean, we have absorbed what what's really genius and brilliant about Freud's insights and then rejected what doesn't seem to work. The idea that a lot of human behavior is unconsciously driven below the surface is a massive insight from Freudian thought. So, Freud proposed a radical idea that is referred to as the iceberg theory of consciousness. And we have an iceberg here, and most of what's involved in the iceberg is underneath the surface. Only the tip is what we see. So, Freud is saying it's the same thing with the consciousness. Most of what's running our consciousness is underneath the surface, and only the tip our, is our self our awareness, our volition, our will is only this small part here, right? So this is what we're aware of and this we're not really aware of. So if you include in this process is things like I mentioned earlier in the learning theory section and the behaviorism section about learning theory, about how your brain will learn things unconsciously, like how to find your way to your classroom and then it doesn't have to relearn that every day. It, it stores it and you don't have to think about it consciously. It's stored down here in the unconscious. And a lot of information, you know, um, post-traumatic stress stored down here in the unconscious. That's why if somebody could, they would change it. If they could just fix it consciously, they would change it. But there's all kinds of drives and principles that are driving us down here. Anytime you say that you're going to study tonight and end up playing games instead, or going out and playing instead, you're finding yourself being driven not by what you decided earlier, your will and self-awareness, but something else, right? So, so this area of the unconscious and the idea that most of our behavior is unconsciously driven is Freud's great insight that he drew from that sequence of stories that we just looked at. He went further. He proposed that our society, uh, psyche is composed of three distinct elements referred to as the id, the ego, and the superego. All right, these are like three subpersonalities in our mind. The id is primal, Freud referred to it as primal sexual and aggressive urges. You can see it reflected here as I want it now, right? And this is any two year old is a primal little id being, right? Walking around, you know, infants to two years old, they're just little ids, you know, they're biological beings that haven't been socialized, right? And the superego is the part of us that absorbs when we are socialized, when we're told what to do and what not to do. So when you hear that voice in your head about how you should behave, it's the super ego voice, you know, the, the internal judge saying what you should be doing, right? And then the ego is trying to deal with reality. Okay, so the id, primal, the ego, reality, the super ego, the ideal self, right? Superman, perfect ego, what you've learned by society, and then have internalized about how you're supposed to be that then becomes a voice in the head, right? And we'll be looking a lot more at these theories as we go along. So here's some more, another slide where we reinforce the ideas of the id, ego, and super ego. Okay, you've got your ego, that's you dealing with reality, trying to deal with reality in front of you, trying to get yourself to work, trying to deal with the flat tire, trying to get the kids dressed, trying to get, you know, yourself out the door and food in your stomach and just reality of the world and then you've got these internal sub personalities that surface and and will take over at different times right actually consume us at very various times but are always sort of there at some level of the other and these are just sort of playful icons but because they're not adequately reflective because the it is not just the devil part of ourselves at all the it is uh, playful, the it is um, sort of our childlike, you know, when you hug and cuddle with somebody, when you play with your dog, you're, you're being, you're involved in your positive id, right? When you're laughing, when you're enjoying yourself, but a person can be overly id dominant, right? They can be too involved in pleasure, 
Um, and the, it can be uncivilized and behave improperly, like a two-year-old having a temper tantrum at the grocery store. And of course, adults can still have ids that are underdeveloped and have temper tantrum in the grocery store, right? And then we have the superego subpersonality. Superego, which is basically um, the ideas, you know, your mom and dad come to you and you say, no, we don't behave like that. We behave like this. We share toys. We do this. We do that. And then school does that to you, you know, and shapes you and molds you and helps you become civilized, right? And that becomes an internal voice in our own mind and an internal judge telling us how we should be. And some people have a positive superego that behaves like an inner coach, you know, pushes you along and encourages to keep going and is maybe strict now and then but is not demoralizing and other people have a very demoralizing superego and one of the things that's useful in therapy is to process out a um, uh, an unhelpful superego, a superego that's too much of a tyrant, right? And also to provide more structure and discipline to somebody who is more id oriented for example. So really useful structure and I think tends to make sense to everybody. Here is um, Freud's model in sort of a graphic form. Again, we have that iceberg principle with most of what is going on unconsciously driven. All right, We're not aware of it. You can think of consciousness of what we're aware of and unconscious is what we're aware, not aware of. And these placements of the id, ego, and superego, they're generic. They're not Totally. I mean, the id isn't totally underground, right? You know, when you're in a id mode. But it's also a lot of biological processes, like the mating drive, for example, that may send you out on Friday night that you don't really think of as an unconscious process pushing your behavior in a particular direction, right? You don't usually think that way. And preconscious is when you sort of know it and sort of don't. You're somewhat aware of it. So how can the superego be preconscious or unconscious? That's where we get into things like a perfectionism um, or an inferiority complex, right? That's when we have patterns that drive our behavior that are sort of stored down here. So we have the recognition that these three aspects of our personality, which are really like sub-personalities have conflicting agendas and are often in a state of conflict. So here you have the id wanting to chase butterflies and the super ego wanting to go back and study, you know. And you can see that happening at any time in one's life. I mean, you're torn between something you really want to do and something you really should do. I think I'm not supposed to play these videos because I have to publish this on YouTube for you to have access to it. So I'm going to encourage you to go back and watch this video link. Use the slideshow. It's really good and kind of weird. 1970s. I'd love to redo that with students. So check that out. That would be like a, a mega extra credit project is to redo this video what it shows about and they have a guy reenacting Freud which is really cool too so but I don't think I can show it on YouTube I think that breaks copyright laws so we've got the interaction the dynamic remember dynamic means busy busy psyche we have the dynamic interaction of the id ego and super ego with the emph emphasis on unconscious so with learning theory the one we looked at before behaviorism, learning theory, happening, you know, rising in Germany at the same time that psychodynamic theory is rising with Freud and he's developing a following, Freud is, in Austria. You have, in, in learning theory, you have the idea that we're, you know, the words that you want to tag are behaviorism, learning theory, conditioned by our environment, shaped by our environment, right? We're shaped and developed by what we learn. With Freud and the psychodynamic perspective, the emphasis is on the unconscious, right? 
and psychoanalysis, the process of psychoanalysis is bringing unconscious stuff, which includes repressed memories and complexes, you know, like inferiority complex, superiority complex, that resulted from childhood, little ways we got distorted in childhood, that get stored down here in the unconscious and then get brought to the light of consciousness in order to be healed. Now, it turns out that it helps, awareness helps, but it, we need more than awareness usually to um, be able to change. I mean, you can be aware of why you have a problem, but still need help changing the behavior of the problem, you know? So that's an example of why this whole awareness isn't all it takes. It takes more. Now, at the time, Freud's claims were, like, shocking. He used sexual terms. Um, talked about all of us having an id, and you see all this propriety. And so he's telling Victorian society that really you're, you know, you got broiling ids underneath your... A seething cauldron, he would say, of sexual and aggressive urges. <laughs> and you can just see all that repression, right? So the zeitgeist, and that means spirit of the times. Zeitgeist means spirit of the times. I'm referring to the cultural influences of the times, which gives each epoch or era a flavor. And, of course, big things when I talk to students about what flavors our times have, they, they talk about things like... You know, cell phones and technology and the World Wide Web and things like that, you know, which are very much part of our current zeitgeist, right? It's really interesting to think about the idea of zeitgeist. So Freud's ideas are emerging, and there's a lot more to learn about Freud, and we do learn a lot more about Freud, particularly on the personality theory section later down the road. Because in that section, that chapter... We go again over these seven perspectives that we're looking at, and right now we've only looked at two perspectives. Behaviorism slash learning theory with the major theorists that we looked at back then of Skinner and Watson. Watson with little Albert, Skinner with the rats and operant conditioning, and now, now Freud and psychodynamic theory. So Freud develops a, a following, and one of his followers is a, a they're called Neo Freudians, and it's his name was Carl Jung. Carl Jung was a Swiss psychologist and an absolute genius, who quickly became Freud's favorite, you know, sort of protege. He's probably about 15 years younger than Freud. He became a member of Freud's psychoanalytic society, and Freud is really getting popularity. You know, I mean, he his theories were outlandish; they garnered a lot of attention. And, um, you know, they, they were the buzz of the town and really gained psychology a name, this new budding field of looking at how disorders can be influenced by the mind in ways that we don't realize, really gave it a name. I mean, it really starts to be on fire. And then we also have Wilhelm Bunt doing his work over there in Germany, you know, and so we've got some official German labs, although Freud steals most of the attention. And in, with, and in Freud's analytic, because people, he starts building a society, you know, and there start being 30 and 40 members of the analytic society, people who are training, doctors who are training with Freud. And then Jung becomes his favorite, right? But Jung had a split with Freud on his, on what he thought about how the psyche was organized. And his ideas about how the psyche were organized were grounded in Freudian ideas, but then they expanded and diverged from them in ways that infuriated Freud. <clears throat> so they ended up having a schism, you know, in 1930s, Freud had to flee. Um, and, uh, he, you know, Nazi Germany, and the only thing he carried with him were Jung's letters strapped to his body, one of the few possessions he had. But they hadn't spoken for many, many years because of Jung's divergent points of view. And Freud, not only was he very, very ambitious, he was also um, very nervous that the fledgling field of psychology would not last if it didn't stick to intensely sort of scientific principles. And maybe he was a little, uh, I don't know, what's the word? Um, unwilling to share 
certainly was unwilling to consider his great protege's ideas. So let's look at what Jung realized um, with this model. Okay, so as Freud's model became more popular, people started to realize that what it reflected was that humanity was consistently and always in an internal tug of war between the you know, primal desires of the id and the oppressive demands of society, the superego, and then the ego is just dealing with reality, trying to make it through, right, with this constant tug of war going on internally. So Jung says, okay, that's good, yes, got it, and yes, most of our behavior is unconsciously determined, but then he he drew some other conclusions, and here, let's follow his logic. He said that if most of our behavior is unconsciously determined, then, and what, what comes, what, what is in the unconscious is what we do not know, then it must also contain all the great things the grand epiphanies, intuitions, insights, divine guidance, sudden creativities also surface from the unknown to the known. So the unconscious is not just composed of this, you know, um, unending internal war between the id and the superego, but also contains everything we don't know yet. All knowledge, all new insights, all new creativity. You know, we've all had the experience of having something just come to us, surface up, not be thought down, but come up. And, you know, Jung had the idea of that deep within us was this deeply abiding higher self, and that was connected to the unknown, and the unknown included the great mystery, and that also included God. You know, Freud was an atheist um, and committed, completely committed to adhering to the scientific principle to the end and very brave and courageous. But Jung observed that people all over the world, a huge portion of their lives um, was related to religion and spirituality. And he saw those as being reflective of something very important to the psyche. And this conclusion that that um, the unknown also contains all these incredible positives is also true. He came up with other ideas that we'll explore later under the personality theory chapter, ideas about the collective unconscious. This idea in, in quick short version is that we all have a personal unconscious, you know, our own personal, what our brain has remembered and learned and thrown into the unconscious, but we also have a collective unconscious. And that's sort of like, you could think of it this way. We have our, um, our bodies have the genetic DNA of our ancestors, while our minds also have the genetic DNA of our ancestors. And they show up as archetypes. Archetypes are primordial forms or images that operate through the psyche. They're like a matrix of structure that the, that the psyche is organized in. Like we all understand the idea of the hero and the heroic journey. And we all understand the idea of the villain. And we all understand the idea of the um, trickster, right? And these are archetypal figures. So the idea that this matrix is sort of stamped into our psyche and then we express it is Jung's incredibly bit brilliant insight. And he also saw this self down here, the, the personal self up here, he would say has a small s, and the higher self down here, self two he referred to it as, the part of us that just knows because it's connected to creativity, guidance, insight, and all that is down here in our unconscious. So Jung's idea was that we want to be in relationship with our, our unconscious. We want to learn from our, our unconscious. And of course, both Freud and Jung thought that one of the ways that the unconscious speaks to us a great deal is through dreams.
you know, and through listening to our dreams, we can um, sort of excavate some of the contents of the unconscious. And Jung had some other methods too, like active imagination that we'll talk about later. So we have this whole idea of the unconscious surfacing and communicating to us. And even somehow genetically there being these collective unconscious and archetypal images that are that are part of our psyche the way that say having an arm and a hand is part of our body intriguing ideas all right so you can see how jung's idea about the psyche is more positive than freud because it incorporates this uh, this more positive dimension instead of a perpetual tug of war and this idea of focusing on the more positive aspect of humanity became known as the humanist school of thought, humanist. Now, some people argue that Jung, this is Carl Jung, was a, is a neo-Freudian and some would put him in the humanist school. So just figure he's, you know, sort of, he's the bridge between the both schools and his expansion of the idea of the unconscious. And, you know, he would speak about things like spirituality and religion, whereas Freud wouldn't, um, moves him over into this humanist school, right? So the humanist school basically <clears throat> looks at how humans are drawn or naturally organized to grow up, to reach up. So that's what they're emphasizing is human potential. The whole human potential movement um, at Barnes & Noble bookstore with the self-help books is entirely grounded. I mean, it reflects different perspectives in there. But the essence of it is humanist, that the power is within you, right? So with Freud, for example, with Freud, his idea was that you sat on the therapist's couch and he would analyze you, right? But with the humanist idea is that the wisdom is within you and it's the job of the counselor to help bring it out, help help bring the brilliance out of you and help you grow to reach your highest potential. You know, the idea of reaching one's highest potential. So we have the power is in your hands and you can make it happen. And through knowledge and coaching and support and learning new ways of being and new skills and listening to the, the voice on your inside, your, your, your still inner voice, right? That inner self with the capital S that Jung would refer to. An early humanist theorist was Abraham Maslow. At Maslow wrote a number of different books, including The Further Reaches of Human Nature, which is Maslow is saying, hey, let's look, you know, Freud was focusing on people who had disorders, and Maslow is saying, let's focus on creating a theory of mind based on, and humanity based on the highest performing people. So you may have heard of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly um, Successful People by Stephen Covey. That's a newer version of this kind of work by Abraham Maslow, and he actually did collect the qualities of self-actualized people, something really great to look at. Um, smart thing, too, for students to take something from this that you're interested in and take it a step further, learn something more through Google at the text, and then bring that into the dialogue, either in your assignment or in the discussion. Believe me, the professor knows what they wrote on these things, and they like seeing. That's what makes you show above and beyond, and you need to show above and beyond. You need to reflect excellence in whatever you do because that's how you move forward. Anyway, you know, looking at one of the cool things for you to look up would be the qualities of self-actualized people by Abraham Maslow, something we look at later, but it's a good thing for you to look at now. What are those qualities? What are the qualities of people who are self-actualized, who actually reach you know, really reach for and to and towards and manifest to some extent their highest vision of themselves. And this doesn't mean that they get famous like Oprah. It means this is the people you admire, you know, and you'll notice that one of the things you admire about them is that they just keep grinding away at the things that are most important to them. So anyway, good thing qualities of self-actualized people. And he also was the architect of this idea of the hierarchy of needs, which we'll look at later. Many of you probably already heard of the hierarchy of needs. And then we're going to take a glance at another humanist theorist, 
that you'll learn a lot about more later, particularly in the therapy section, because this gentleman, Carl Rogers, and his idea of client-centered therapy, which is the idea that the client has the wisdom within them, and your idea is to help them connect with it and bring it out, um, is really the undergirding of all counseling. That, And the idea of approaching people with deep respect and not a sense of being above them. People don't like to be in an environment and they don't reveal their truth when they're with somebody who acts like they're above them. And Rogers really helped that happen and identified the three main qualities that need to be there for a therapist. And a lot of research has borne this out, that if these three things are a major part of therapy, then um, the therapy is often considered by the client to be considered to be uh, useful and helpful. And these three things are empathy, and that means that the person feels heard and felt with, like the counselor can really connect with what the person is experiencing. This idea called positive regard, which means that the counselor is focusing on the best in the person. It doesn't mean that they deny or um, ignore character problems that might be present. It means that they are still able to see the person as the deep humanity of the person. We'll talk more about positive regard because it doesn't mean just having a Pollyanna attitude towards somebody. It, it does mean looking at something realistically, but at the same time, seeking for the highest good within the reality that you're in, I think, might be uh, the approach. And then genuineness. The therapist needs to not be fake. And so these are the three keys to client-centered therapy, right? which we'll look at more obviously in the... Um, therapy section. But this is a humanist approach, right? So shifting the emphasis. Okay, those were the hardest. Okay, just so you know, the rest of them are a lot easier. So we've talked about behaviorism. All right, and so let me see if I can find behaviorism with the three main ways we learn, right? Learning theory, Okay, modeling, operant conditioning, reinforcement and punishment, and classical conditioning. We've talked about Freud. There he is in Austria. And Freud's iceberg model, right? And here we have it again with the id, ego, super ego. You Google iceberg model, you get millions of these, and you'll see the id, ego, super ego kind of like placed in different places. So don't take that too seriously. Really, dimensions of our id are unconscious, dimensions are pre-conscious, and dimensions are conscious, and that's the case with all three of these. Okay, so we the second perspective is the psychodynamic, and then we have the humanist perspective, um, sort of opened by Jung's broader view of the psyche, including of the unconscious, and then expanded on by humanist Abraham Maslow, and Carl Rogers. And these are two of the theorists we'll learn more about as we go down the road. All right, I promise you it gets easier now. The next perspective, this is number four, the cognitive perspective, okay? And cognitive means thinking, <clears throat> and we think in zillions of different ways. So cognitive means thinking, thinking means cognitive. How do we think? We have intelligence, thinking patterns, memory, perception, problem solving, imagination, learning styles, dreaming. You know, our mind does an amazing amount of things, and some minds do different things that other minds don't do, you know, like musicians and things. So our mind can do a lot, and studying all the different kinds of things that the mind can do in terms of thinking is the cognitive perspective. This perspective rose in say the 1930s and 40s as the military in particular started doing intelligence tests for soldiers okay so which is the source of our intelligence test so cognitive you want to tag that with thinking all right that's what it means it relates to anything that does has to do with thinking and cognitive behavioral are often paired right because how we think influences how we behave doesn't it if we think we can um, 
tackle a problem we usually can't, if we think we can't deal with it, then we need to, in order to deal with it, we're going to have to find a way to change that mode of thinking, right? And surprisingly, a lot of the ways that we change the way we think is to behave differently, which teaches our mind that we can be differently than we thought. Ah, okay, it's okay if you didn't stay with that one. All right, so then we had, so cognitive's number four, now we have number five. I told you this next part's going to go faster. Number five is the sociocultural perspective, which rose in, say, the 1960s, say, post if you think 1950s, if you've seen the show Mad Men, it's a very good uh, depiction of the period of the 1950s. Here we have the 1960s and 70s. We start to have a growing awareness of um, cultures around the world. National people start being able to see things on the news and on TV in the 1970s. We have the Vietnam War being televised, first majorly televised war. And then we have, you know, global awareness now that that we're um, adapting to. So the sociocultural perspective is launched from the awareness that cultures and traditions and societies result in different kinds of behaviors. And we can compare this to the next, our um, sixth perspective, which is the evolutionary perspective. So while the sociocultural perspective is looking at particular societies and cultures and how they shape us to be a particular way, the evolutionary perspective is looking at how we're all the same, how humanity, what's common amongst all humans, right? What ways are we completely the same, right? So these are the three main themes of the evolutionary perspective. And the evolutionary perspective is a huge perspective that we are learning from today. I mean, just massive amount of information, very exciting information from this experience perspective happening over the last 20 years. So <clears throat> the first theme of the evolutionary perspective, and you need to know these, is that all behaviors from smiles to kisses is seen as having evolved to benefit survival. So evolutionary theorists have the interesting way of approaching things. They look at, they take a behavior like kissing or smiling, and they say, how is this beneficial to survival? It's here because it helps us survive. How? So that's a very interesting angle or approach for thinking about our behavior. The second thing they look at is what characteristics do all humans share compared to those we see only in certain cultures, right? So that's evolutionary versus sociocultural. So for example, do we see eating disorders in all cultures? Do we see schizophrenia in all cultures? Is it at the same rates in all cultures, right? Very interesting. So we find out if something is at the same rate in cultures all over the world, like schizophrenia is, that's very interesting to know. And we know that there's not a cultural phenomena that is making this happen. Whereas with eating disorders, much more prominent in Western cultures, not, well, people who have been exposed to Western media really is the, is the link with eating disorders. So that is a cultural phenomenon. So we do actually have some disorders that are a cultural phenomena that are that are made far worse, and we have far larger incidents because of culture operating in a particular way, right? Okay, and then the third aspect of evolutionary theory is it, is it gets us to look at deep time, at the big picture timeline of human development, which goes on for a very long period of time, right? A couple hundred thousand years, we can say, for the human species. And we will look at this more, this idea of what does it mean to look at how we've evolved over 200,000 years? The paleo diet is an example of looking at this big picture timeline because the paleo diet is essentially saying, look, we, we, we ate a certain way as hunter-gatherer people for hundreds of thousands of years, and so therefore our bodies are very much designed to eat that way, right? So that's the idea behind the paleo diet and how it is an evolutionary kind of idea. All right, just a couple more slides to this lecture, then some practice questions, and this is most of the information that is covered on the quiz you can find in this. So, of course, you want to make sure to use your study guide, and anything that isn't, you're not able to fill in and know what it's talking about from the study guide from these lectures, you want to go to the text. All right.
So by the 1960s, these theories about human psychology became known as personality theory, each with a slightly different approach to explaining why we think, feel, and behave the way we do, right? And the one we didn't really talk about much was biological. And biological, of course, relates to things like drug therapy, um, looking at psychiatry, and what are the biological reasons behind what's happening. Menopause, for example, you could say, um, or hormones. When we say they're doing it because of hormones, we're looking at the biological dimension of it, right? And we have behaviorism. I think I'm going to go ahead and put numbers on these. And we have behaviorism, psychodynamic, Freud, dynamic busy psyche, remember iceberg theory, id ego, super ego, humanist reaching for highest potential, right? Personal responsibility is involved in this, by the way. You can only reach for your highest potential if you dig in and find the guts to do it, right? So that's part of the deal. So the fact that we can all grow and change, looking for the highest good in people, cultivating that, being a kind of a coach approach to counseling instead of an analysis, I'm going to analyze you approach to counseling. Cognitive thinking, intelligence tests, things like, um, you know, realizing that we all, all have different learning styles. The brain is wired in a wide variety of ways, and so that's cognitive. The awareness of a sociocultural world where people have different society and cultural traditions that influence their behavior, and then the evolutionary tradition, the idea that um, we've been a, what's common amongst humans all over the world, that we're one species, right? So what's common to our species all over the world is one of the things evolutionary theorists look for. How are we all the same? How are we wired based on deep time, 200,000 years of being a species, and I'm forgetting the third one because I'm tired. Let's see. What characteristics do we all share? And that's an interesting one because one of the characteristics we all share is facial expressions, like, right, mad, sad, glad. You can recognize a happy person no matter what country they're from. Same with an angry person and so on. And then all of these are joined by the biological perspective, right? Which we are a body-mind. And, you know, this brain of ours is distributed throughout our body through the spinal cord and the nerves and the central and peripheral nervous system. So the brain is distributed throughout the body. We are, we are a body-mind brain, all right? And so the biological emphasizes how our thoughts, feelings, and behavior are influenced by physical processes like genetics, haha, <laughs> brain structure and chemistry, exercise and diet, and so on. So, you know, it's not just things like um, psychiatric medications or medications, period. Because interestingly, pain relievers like Tylenol actually relieve emotional pain as well, similar pain receptors. All right, the goal of this was to get the idea, understanding that anytime we try to understand why somebody thinks, feels, and behaves the way they do, right, that we look at all seven traditions. We don't only look from one. We The training is to look from all seven. And this isn't completely thorough. For example, from the East, we're getting the influence of the tradition of energy medicine. And, and I, I promise you, that will be a very large one in the next five years. We're going to get more and more information about energy medicine coming from science and so that's going to validate it. You know, like seven years ago, we used to only talk about four of the perspectives, biological, behaviorism, psychodynamic, and humanism. And now we've added cognitive, socio and cultural, and evolutionary to this intro chapter, right? And there will be a few more added in time. But these are the dominant seven. And the following um, practice quiz questions um, have you work through. Here are seven questions, and there's just one perspective that goes with each question. All right, unless I messed it up, which I hope not. I don't think so. And then here are some more practice questions, and then let's see, do I give you an answer guide anywhere? It doesn't look like it. 
second I'm going to have to provide the answer guide. So these give you some practice on these, right? And you want to do a basic matching and have a basic idea of how to be able to identify what goes where, right? When you read a question, are they mostly talking about the behaviorist perspective, the psychodynamic perspective, the humanist, the cognitive, the sociocultural, the evolutionary, the biological? And what you want to do is look for buzz terms to connect to that. So when you see learning theory, you know it's behaviorism. When you see conditioning, you know it's behaviorism. When you see Freud or unconscious, you know you're mostly talking psychodynamic. When you see personal growth, human potential, um, you know you're talking humanism. When you see the word thinking, it's cognitive. When you see social or cultural, it's sociocultural. When you see anything related to survival, it's evolutionary, adaptive, survival, adaptive, value of behavior, or deep time, right? Long time. And anything related to physical influences like genetics, the brain, your nervous system, neurotransmitters, hormones, it's biological, right? So you, so you, so psychologists, when they, when they sit with somebody, they're thinking from all these angles, not just one, you know? They're not just saying, oh, he's doing it because he learned it that way. That's one piece, right? What else is going on? What's unconscious? What is the person hope for and dream for? And is some of that being thwarted or are they being looked at as less than human, right? Do they need conditional regard? How do they think about things? What does their society and culture influence? How does that influence them? Evolutionary is kind of more of a bigger picture thing. It gives us insights on things like paleo diet and a lot of other things that I'll share with you as we go along. Um, and then biological, what's going on with their body, you know, and how is the body influencing that behavior. So it's a really good practice to go around when you ask questions of yourself or you look at somebody else and you're going, why are they doing that? Walk your mind through the seven perspectives, you know, and say what could be biologically behind it, what's behind it in terms of what they've learned about how to be, what might be unconscious here, what, what, what do they hope for and dream of is in their life, what is... What is a potential that maybe is, um, you know, because people get very frustrated when their potential is um, stamped down or oppressed, right? And then how are they thinking? How does their mind work in terms of thought? How's their environment, social and cultural environment? How's that influencing the situation? What kind of evolutionary forces from the past are driving us, you know? Like sugar, getting addicted to sugar is an evolutionary imperative because our ancestors needed sugar and it was rare. So we're vulnerable to it now. We're overexposed to it. So that's, that's us bumping against our evolutionary history. And there are a lot of things like that. And then where are they in terms of what's happening with their body? You know, That includes things like chronic pain or stored stress from not exercising and moving enough. Okay. I will post an answer sheet for these. I'll put it on your study guide page. All right. And that concludes the second lecture, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day. And I will actually, I should probably finish it up on this slide. And I will see you inside.